uh, the new suburbs, and, and beyond. So exclusionary zoning and restrictive land use policies enforce this jurisdictional segregation that's really driving the segregation that we have now. So uh, moving on to economic segregation, uh, for neighborhoods to be unequal, you have to have some household inequality. If everybody had the same income, then you couldn't have any economic segregation. Uh, so household income inequality, which is uh, uh, shown um, uh, in, in the, the blue line, has been increasing steadily in almost all every US metropolitan area. And so these lines represent the, the Gini coefficients uh, average across about 264 metropolitan areas. Uh, so and, as is shown in this graph, neighborhood inequality grew more rapidly than household inequality, starting around 1980. So the implication is that neighborhoods became more unequal for two different reasons. First, there was a lot more inequality to go around. But secondly, uh, households sorted into neighborhoods in ways that led to a greater proportion of household in income inequality to be between rather than within neighborhoods. In other words, the degree of residential sorting uh, of households on the basis of income, economic segregation, increased. So virtually every metropolitan area saw rising um, in inequality of household income. That was just universal. But New York and Philadelphia, both uh, on, on the right there, I'm sorry, on the left, both experienced increases in income inequality. Uh, and that was the dominant pattern seen in most metropolitan areas. And they also had increases in economic segregation, so that neighborhood inequality increased even faster than household inequality. But if you look at uh, the two cities on the right, Denver and Minneapolis, they also had rising household income inequality, because everybody did. But they didn't make things worse by having greater economic segregation. Uh, this was uh, the degree of sorting of inequality within and between neighborhoods remained stable in Denver and even decreased a bit in Minneapolis. So the ability of some metropolitan areas to constrain the rise in neighborhood inequality due to, due to the increases in household inequality points to the importance of local policies that underpin economic segregation, exclusionary zoning, density restrictions, public transit, school assignment, and the location of public and assisted housing. So um, uh, in fact, I, I have a, another figure. Uh, I'm, I'm probably running a little short on time, but uh, I took the, the distribution of neighborhood inequality across the 264 metropolitan areas. And if you, uh, just, uh, if you hold income inequality constant across all metros, the picture hardly changes. So it's not differences in household inequality that are driving the, uh, neighborhood inequality. But if we hold economic segregation constant, you see that most of the variation in neighborhood inequality is, is, uh, goes away. <coughs> So it's really those forces that determine what type of housing is built and how the housing is distributed that explain which metros have more uh, neighborhood inequality. So um, you know, it, sort of drawing to a conclusion, the failure to address neighborhood disparities, given what we now know, thanks to these folks over here, about the consequences for children, is tantamount to accepting permanent inequality. Uh, as, as Raj and his colleagues wrote in a recent paper, quote, blacks and whites are now in a steady state where the black-white income gap is due almost entirely to differences in rates of intergenerational mobility. Uh, I think the vastly unequal neighborhoods that many black children experience in, impedes intergenerational mobility through many channels, while white children, even poor white children, rarely experience similar levels of neighborhood disadvantage. The inequality of neighborhoods is what sustains and replicates racial inequality. So uh, in, in closing, neighborhood inequality is not inevitable. We have it because we build it. You know, in fact, we legally require neighborhood inequality. It's built into the housing stock by law. And, and as Bill Wilson said in the Godkin lecture, and, and I, I got a transcript of it and reread it, um, he said, quote, one has the urge to shout, enough is enough. And I think we as a nation, we have to muster the same sense of moral urgency that animated Bill Wilson's uh, Godkin lecture and indeed his whole career, and harness it to change the policies and practices that created and that still maintain uh, neighborhood inequality. Thank you.
showing slides mainly so I can show pictures of uh, Professor Wilson. So what I'm going to do is tell you a, a brief story um, about Professor William and the neighborhood effect. And I'm going to do it through the lens of both the history of an intellectual idea and also our own history. Um, it's a little bit scary, but I've been colleagues and friends with Bill for 28 years. I looked at the calendar yesterday. Um, starting uh, when I moved to the University of Chicago in 1991. Mike, Mike. Mike. Where's the mic? Don't they have like. Yeah, I'm a wanderer. I can give you a. So. 1991, is that better? No. 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 Uh, I think we need the tech experts here. Okay. Yeah. He should be turning it on momentarily. Yeah. Yeah, in the back. Okay. So I will show. There we go. There we go. Okay. So 1991, I moved um, as a senior colleague to the University of Chicago. And Bill was there. It was very heady times. Um, I have to say, even though I was tenured at that point, I was quite intimidated to walk into the first faculty meeting, and there's Bill and Jim Coleman and Doug Massey and on and on. So I'm like, just can I hide in the corner? I'm not going to say anything. But what I want to do is zip back a few years earlier um, to a time uh, when I was perhaps a little even more intimidated. And that was as a young assistant professor, untenured, in the middle of the cornfields in the University of Illinois. And so what was I doing in 1985 as an untenured assistant professor? Well, you're supposed to be grinding out articles and reading the ASR if you're a sociologist and all that, which I dutifully did but found it incredibly boring. It just wasn't doing it for me intellectually. I mean, I was doing my job. I was publishing, uh, even published in the ASR, but it, my own article bored me. So um, <laughs> I... Probably the wrong thing to do. I was casting about, and I don't know how I came across this, Bill, but this is what I was reading. Unpublished paper that had been presented at a conference on poverty and family structure, the widening gap between evidence and public policy issues. Now, how it got to Urbana, I don't know, but I read it, and that was like the light bulb that went off, like for a lot of you people that read um, The Truly Disadvantaged, and actually you'll see this is... Um, going to become part of that. So this was just like I put everything down. I remember not leaving my office for hours. And it made sense to me because also I had spent a lot of time reading and thinking about the urban sociology and the grand tradition of the Chicago School and neighborhood effects. In fact, my dissertation was on what today we would call neighborhood effects and looking at a lot of these issues. But I began to reshape it in my own mind based on this article and some of the other unpublished work. Why? Well, what thrilled me about that work uh, was really a simple but powerful idea. And that is, Bill was interested not just in the local and neighborhood effects, but it was really about linking macrostructural change, the changes in society that people were living out on the ground in neighborhoods. And of course, this all sounds familiar to you because that's what the truly disadvantaged was deindustrialization, the outmigration of the middle class, and community life. In these two maps, and we've seen really sophisticated maps today. Uh, I'm going to go like really retro here. <laughs> Bill Wilson, this is simple, but it's powerful. This is 1970. This is the rate of unemployment. 15 to 19 percent, yeah, it's kind of concentrated for sure in the Lower West Side and a bit on the south side of Chicago on the west side. Remember now the argument in the truly disadvantaged about the increase in the concentration of poverty and deindustrialization just 10 years later. We know today, I mean, if you look at change over 10 years, you don't see what you see here, which is a tremendous change. You didn't change designations here, the spread, not just the rise in unemployment, because 
on the north side, things are pretty hunky-dory. It's the deepening concentration across a large swath of the west side and into the near south side. So I just, this, I'm, I'm eating this up, and um, I'm thinking about it, I'm writing about it, and um, I guess I went out on a limb and was combining it with my own work on neighborhoods and cities, and what I was reading in these unpublished papers about the effects of the concentration of disadvantage, but also employment, and how it was related to family structure. And in criminology, family structure was a strong predictor of crime, but a lot of it was being interpreted at the time. The subculture of violence theory was tremendously influential. So I'm navigating these waters of race, urban subcultures, race and crime, which was the dominant narrative, and published um, an article just before this book came out. <clears throat> The reason this is important is because 1987, now remember, these were the unpublished papers, it comes out, and all of a sudden, I see, wow, there they are. Those are the articles I had been reading. Social change, social dislocations, poverty structure, and so forth. So I'm like, boy, I hope I got this right. (laughs) Because um, I am now on record. A month before, I had published a paper in the American Journal of Sociology that um, as I look back on it, I'm like, I can't believe I titled the paper um, like this, given the, the debates at the time. But it was basically about violence. It was about comparative study across cities and violence. And it was basically taking the argument that unemployment, and I actually learned from the truly disadvantaged and actually calculated what uh, Bill called the male marriageable pool index, its effects on family disruption. But importantly, at least in my mind, what I had done here was to collect racially disaggregated data. That is, this wasn't just a study of African Americans, but it was a comparative study, (coughs) excuse me, of whites as well. And the results, I won't get into the analysis, seemingly unrelated unrelated regressions and others that showed that the coefficients in the effects, if you can call it an effect, we could be much more liberal in those days about (laughs) the use of the term, um, were similar across the, excuse me, let me grab a uh, water here. The, um, yeah, that's better. So the The key here is the similarity across racial groups and arguing essentially that there was an invariance. Now, what do we mean by invariance? What I meant was that the ecological conditions that had produced the neighborhoods in the cities were racially unique through deindustrialization, segregation, racially unique factors. But nonetheless, the more proximate measures and processes were the same. And you can see the last part here. There's nothing inherent in black culture that's conducive to crime. Rather, persistently high rates of black crime appear to stem from the structural linkages among unemployment, economic deprivation, and family disruption in urban black communities. I was terrified. (laughs) Because now that truly disadvantaged was out, and this is the man behind the story. (laughs) That was one serious dude. So I'm looking at this. This is the back cover of The Truly Disadvantaged. And I'm thinking, I, I, I must have done it wrong. He's going to tear me to shreds. Because if you look at this, right? I mean, he's got the tie. He's got the pipe. <laughs> penetrating eyes. And even a better picture. Bill, I don't know if you remember this picture. It's a little blurry because I couldn't get a good quality. But, whoa. <laughs> this flipped me out. Purple suit. Crossed arms leaning against an oak tree in a gothic building at the University of Chicago. (laughs) So I'm like, he's going to rip my lungs out once he uh, reads this uh, paper because I really, you know, you write the paper, you're you're an assistant professor. But then I thought, well, of course, I don't have to worry. He's Bill Wilson. He's not going to read this paper. He won't even know about it. (laughs) So I thought, I'm safe. I'm safe. I don't know if you remember. I don't remember the exact moment. It was late. I think it was early 1988. It had give me a few months to, to uh, panic. Uh, and there was no email in those days, right? The phone, 
he actually, the phone rang. I picked up the phone. It was a female voice. I'm calling from the office of Professor William Julius Wilson. He would like to meet with you to talk about a paper. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, I really did screw up. Um, so I figured, okay, I can suffer through a phone conversation. She said, no, in person. <laughs> Set a date to meet at the American Sociological Association meetings. And Bill, uh, if you remember this, it was uh, at breakfast. And I went in terrified and came out enlightened, because it was the bill that we all know. It was simply a conversation for an hour about ideas, about the work, where are you going, what kinds of other work are you doing. It was fantastic. I was like walking on air afterwards. And five years later, uh, we ended up being um, colleagues. And I wanted to say a few minutes, uh, for a few minutes about that um, relationship, which includes collaboration, friendship. What I, what I want to emphasize is just one or two things that, um, fortunately, we did together. And also emphasize Bill's uh, insight about setting research agendas and for the future. And what we did is to write a paper together, actually, at Chicago, which turned out to be quite formative in my own thinking and, and fortunately as well, quite influential. It was just a ch book chapter, which, you know, you're not supposed to write a book chapter, but actually um, it was great. And, and Bill and I just discussed this and we really came together because, as I mentioned earlier, the study of crime we thought, and I thought in particular, was quite flawed and put forth uh, a rather provocative... <laughs> toward a theory of race, crime, and urban inequality. And the key here, and this is where the, the term racial invariance, it's been labeled by others. The only mention of the word invariant came in one sentence. The sources of violent crime appear to be remarkably invariant across race and instead rooted in the structural differences among communities. And here again was a theoretical working through of how you had structural forces that create racially unique situations, but yet... Um, everyone, you know, the humanity of people, whether white, black, brown, the influences on crime um, were, in our phrasing, um, racially invariant. I don't have time to get into that more. But it's this distinctly sociological viewpoint, we think, because it's really trying to, as the truly disadvantaged did, mediate between the macro and, in this case, the micro level of neighborhoods and social organization. So, on to Harvard. I'll say that in the last few minutes, and I want to thank Bill here for the collaboration um, to, to our work here at Harvard um, and also to Looking Head. Um, I'm Grateful for Bill's forward to uh, my last book, Great American City, Chicago, and the Enduring Neighborhood Effect. I'm not going to say anything about it other than the entire book is about neighborhood effects and concentration effects, and the intellectual influence runs deep throughout the book. Um, secondly, thank you, Bill, um, for your leadership and project director of a project at the Hutchins Center on Race, Class, and Cumulative Adversity. Lots of great work done. We had a great run there. Um, several colleagues, and also thanks for building on the past, but also an emphasis on setting uh, the future. And I'm going to say this very quickly. We were asked to do a reanalysis, if you will, of the 1995 paper. It's been a while, right? So 20 years plus, and there was a plenary session at the criminology meetings. And we were invited by the editors of the Du Bois Review in a special volume to do a review. I was reluctant. You know, I don't like to sometimes revisit now. We've been there. We've, we've done that. We set our piece. But then we became convinced that it was important not just to reflect on the past, but to set, at least uh, suggest an agenda for the future. And we did. And what I would emphasize about this, and it's really a reflection on on, on Bill's way of, of thinking in an important way is enduring in new challenges in 21st century America, right? The truly disadvantage is not just about what happened in 1970 and 1980, but some of the ideas properly reframed to take into account the new kinds of social changes 
are as relevant as ever, and that's what we did, and laid out in a theoretical, logical form, hypothesis uh, about the future. So that speaks to, I think, the idea of Bill's research as being something uh, certainly will not go away, um, not in my work, and I think not in a lot of others. So the Bill Wilson that I was intimidated by in the early, uh, late 80s, um, and I was thinking of Skip's remarks last night about trying to recruit Bill and that stare from across the table. Um, today, this is the Bill we know, right? A scholar of giant intellect and uncommon decency and warmth. And someone else had mentioned that. Several people have. This is really a unique property. So many academics are out there, loud, shouting, tweeting, read my work. That's not Bill. Bill is the opposite of that because the work itself speaks volumes. And the uncommon decency and warmth I really want to end with, but I, what I also want to say is, and I thought about this last night, is this Bill just a little more relaxed in life um, <laughs> and happy? I'm going to make the argument that it's always been the same Bill. If you look back now in the pictures, and I have another one, he doesn't have quite the same smile. <laughs> Soulful eyes. This is not a, in attack mode. And this actually links to what Cornell was saying last night. This is, a, you know, Socratic type method. He's sitting here saying, What do you have to say? <laughs> I'm here to listen. I'm here to argue. But I'm not going to rip your lungs out. And uh, even, even the purple suit by the oak tree. <laughs> These are all the same bill. Thank you. That was great, Rob. <laughs> this is such a strange experience. <laughs> I'm having so much fun at this conference. So Professor Skip Gates gave Bill a family lineage last night, <clears throat> which by itself was was remarkably moving to see. I, I can I can just speak into this, okay. um, and I was looking around last night and then today, and and you know my my academic lineage is in this room. Everybody's here. And the two closest links are the man who just spoke, Robert Sampson, and, uh, and the patriarch is William <laughs> Julius Wilson. Uh, so this is, for me, um, intimidation is not the word. It, it's uh, just kind of strange experience, but it's a tremendous, tremendous honor to be here. Uh, I'm so grateful to be here. Um, and so what I thought I would do, I'm, I'm in the midst of a uh, program of research that's focusing on the relationship between space and inequality. Uh, Bill Wilson brought back this focus on space and inequality. Uh, it had been missing as the field shifted toward survey research, and we started studying people as individuals isolated from everybody else. Uh, William Julius Wilson brought sociology back into the discourse on poverty uh, and brought space back. Uh, so while I, I'll talk a little bit about this program of work, but really the goal is to kind of uh, uh, relay some of the lessons that I learned and that we all might learn uh, from watching, from observing uh, William Julius Wilson. The first one is be provocative. Okay, so um, we've heard about the argument made in the declining significance of race. Um, We've heard about the willingness to talk about and put forth a theory about the relationship between shifting urban economies and structural changes that were taking place in cities and cultural adaptation, behaviors uh, that arose from that. Um, and this is a lesson that not to get attention, but be provocative make sure people are paying attention, and then hit them with that deep theory, that empirical precision, the clarity of thought and the writing. 
go back and read The Truly Disadvantaged and, and you know, the writing itself, the clarity of thought and writing is remarkable. Okay, so for this program of research, the guiding hypothesis, which I'll state in a more provocative way than I probably usually would, is that space may now be the most important dimension of American inequality, okay? And I'm not gonna go deep into any of these claims, uh, but just quickly, I'm gonna show you again the map that Raj, Raj, do I have permission to show any maps from your website? I just want a blanket nod to get, all right, perfect, <laughs> thanks. I, I do it anyway, so I appreciate the formal. Uh, okay, so this is the map that, that Raj showed on, on variation in upward mobility. What this is telling us is that spatial inequality is extreme, okay? And, and you could show a whole bunch of different maps that show this at a very local level, block to block, neighborhood to neighborhood, but we have a spatial challenge in the United States when we talk about inequality. Uh, it is extremely rigid. Okay, so these are, are graphs from my own work, just showing the intergenerational persistence of neighborhood advantage and disadvantage. And the, the higher the column, the stronger their pers persistence from one generation to the next. And I won't go through all of this, but the, the, uh, the black columns here are showing the persistence for people who stay in the same place, in this case, the same county. And the white columns are for people who move to a different county. So what this is telling us is that neighborhood advantage and disadvantage are passed down across generations. And part of the reason is because there's this, this spatial inequality from place to place, okay? That new form or expanding, strengthening form of inequality is highlighted by a whole bunch of work. I like this, this graph, which you can't see, but this, is, this shows on the y-axis the difference between people who leave all of these cities in terms of educational attainment and people who arrive, okay? So in the, in, the top, uh, uh, in the top of this graph are cities where the newcomers have much greater education than the folks who are leaving. And then on the x-axis is, is uh, home values, okay? So this is just telling us about this new uh, challenge, not new, this growing challenge of regional inequality, of superstar cities, and of the places left behind. And as opportunities, as jobs, good jobs, are increasingly becoming concentrated in particular places, particular regions of the country, migration to those places has fallen. Okay, so this top line on the graph just shows the people who move from one year to the next. And this is an underappreciated trend in the US uh, that the proportion of, the percentage of people who move from one year to the next has fallen roughly by half, okay? Um, now, it's more complicated than that, but what worries me is that this is particularly pronounced among more disadvantaged segments of the population. Okay, so we have a dilemma. We have a dilemma because spatial inequality is particularly rigid. It is extreme. It is taking on new forms as places become more and more unequal from each other, and mobility is falling. Access to those areas of opportunity is falling over time. Okay, lesson number two, take theory seriously. And this is an understatement. I would have revised this slide, okay? Believe in theory. <laughs> Build your work around deep, strong theory, theoretical arguments. Every student, everyone who had Bill in grad school can attest to this. The question you will get when you talk to Bill Wilson, what is your theoretical framework? And no one is ready for it when it comes, but that's the question that every one of us got. What is your theory? What theory are you building on? What ideas are you putting together to make this empirical argument, okay? So that motivates me to ask the question of why. <clears throat> why is space becoming the most important dimension of American inequality? And this, this uh, has pushed me to think about the theory and it's pushing me toward what I'm calling the spatial relational model of American inequality. A few of the core components of this theory, which I'll state very briefly. Since the 1960s, social problems and their solutions, and I mean things, problems like social unrest, I mean problems like joblessness, concentrated poverty, violent crime, pollution, these problems have increasingly come to be seen in spatial terms, okay? And this has led to a shift, a shift where we used to have dialogues about national projects to overcome some of these major challenges. 
over time, those, that national project to confront some of these challenges has become more and more of a spatial project, okay? The spatial project, the most important feature of the spatial project to respond to the problems that are most visible in American cities but that are, are found all across the country has been to build what I call invisible barricades, okay? Invisible barricades I define as informal or formal barricades that define who can and who cannot occupy a given space, okay? And I'm talking about some of the things that Paul started to mention. I'm talking about the formation of new local governments that separate places like Atlanta from Sandy Springs, okay? That separate all those little municipalities around St. Louis, it's not an accident. I'm talking about gated communities, business improvement districts. I'm, call, I'm talking about land use regulations, high, our highway system, our public housing system, which was built to divide spaces, okay? These are examples of what I consider the most common intervention in the urban space to deal with the rise of social problems, particularly from the 1960s forward, the prevalence of invisible barricades, okay? This change, this focus on invisible barricades and the spatial project to respond to American inequality by erecting barricades to quarantine social problems in, in separate neighborhoods, to preserve and protect advantage, and to restrict who can access those advantaged places. This project means that that we have to think about inequality differently. It means that we have to think about the conditions in disadvantaged neighborhoods in relation to the conditions in advantaged neighborhoods. Okay, and this is why I call it a spatial relational model. Okay, I'll move a little bit more quickly. Third, get the right answer. Okay, we, we have talked about the truly disadvantaged and this theory was remarkable. I mean, when you actually, Bill was the first person to notice a lot of people, let me say that differently, a lot of people noticed that something different was happening in American City. Bill was the first person to put together a theory to explain it. That included civil rights advances and demographic change and shifting urban economies. It's just a remarkable theory, okay? And more remarkable is that he was right. <laughs> I mean, it has stood the test of time. It has been refined. There are specific pieces that have been more or less important but this theory was right. It is absolutely remarkable to see. Okay, so then the challenge for me is how do we develop a research design? And here I'm gonna stray away from my work and, and, and try to use the rest of the time to really focus on Bill. But how do we identify, how do we develop a research design to identify the effect of invisible barricades? If I'm making the claim that this is, this is a primary reason why spatial inequality has become so important, how do we identify uh, the effect of these kinds of barricades. And so here I'm drawing back on Raj's uh, data and I'm trying to look at natural experiments that make it more likely that these kinds of invisible barricades will be formed. So using rivers and streams as an instrument, they make it more easy to identify boundaries that can be then made formal boundaries in space to separate cities from each other, to create new school districts and so forth. So I'm gonna skip over the details of uh, that research agenda and focus on the last two lessons. The fourth is make your work useful. For anyone who doubts how useful the work that William Julius Wilson has done, if you were around last night, you saw Bill Clinton deliver his video message thanking Bill for his work over time, okay? For anyone who doubts how useful Bill's work has been to social science, look around. This is a person who has inspired so many people and who just has led so many people to social science and to sociology, okay? Okay, so in this, in my goal here is, is that, it, it, very similar to, to Paul's argument, is, is that when we talk about empirical work on neighborhood effects, um, we have to encourage our colleagues to explicitly focus on the relationship between communities on either side of invisible barricades that have been set up to define and identify every inch of American soil, okay? So we can no longer talk about neighborhood effects as if this applies to disadvantaged neighborhoods, as if those neighborhoods on the other side of the boundaries 
are irrelevant to the discussion. And the same principle uh, applies to policy discussions. Okay, so we talk an awful lot in this literature about how to allow people to move to different kinds of neighborhoods. And we talk an awful lot about what types of investments are necessary in disadvantaged neighborhoods. Okay, what I call scaling the barricades and investing behind the barricades. We have to talk about breaking down those barricades as well. Okay, we have to talk about things like the home mortgage interest deduction and why we have a housing policy that devotes this amount of money. Our largest housing policy is designed to encourage people to buy the, the biggest house in the most exclusive neighborhoods. And then their entire financial life is dependent on that system saying the same. So we have to talk about what those barricades look like, how we can break down those barricades. Last one, <laughs> try to be inspiring, try to be kind. My story of, of being introduced to William Julius Wilson was I was in college and it was uh, a little bit later than everybody else who was introduced to, to Wilson. So I read him probably in my sophomore or junior year uh, around 1999, and, and so, you know, 11 or 12 years after the, the book had been published, The Truly Disadvantaged, and I read that book, and um, I just had never read anything so beautiful and so brilliant, and I read that book, and I decided right then I'm going to do whatever I can to go work with this person. <laughs> and then I met him years later. And, you know, there's no reason why William Julius Wilson should care about, you know, I'm, so I'm a white guy with red hair who's raised in the suburbs, like liberal parents, I care about inequality. There are a lot of people out there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Minus the red hair, there are a lot of people that have this profile. And William Julius Wilson sat with me and listened to me and took me seriously. And then in the subsequent years, he showed, as a lot of people have said, this extraordinary level of generosity, uh, but also just kindness. And, and so that part is what is, is so unique uh, to Bill Wilson. And I'm so uh, lucky and I'm so grateful that I had the chance to know him. So thank you, Bill. Yes. Yes, please. <laughs> Again, four excellent presentations from four superb scholars. Just like to make one uh, minor correction. <laughs> My suit in Rob's slide. <laughs> was not purple. <laughs> it was, I know, I know. It looked purple on that slide, distorted by the photograph. It was gray. So I'd like to give one more hand of uh, applause for the audience, I mean, for the panelists. It was an amazing set of presentations. I'd also like to check with Abby. How much time do we have before we? 15. 15, sorry, guys. OK, so cut in half. So let's start to take questions. We already have one person there, and then we'll move to you next. Hi. Thanks. Yeah, great. Khalil Mohammed, a teacher at Harvard. I wanted to ask Raj a question and maybe uh, mix it up a little with uh, Paul and, uh, and Pat on the question of uh, barriers. So I'm not an economist, I'm a historian, and I've never had an opportunity to explore this question, but I'm intrigued by it. So when economists predict lifetime earnings based on some improved outcome, you've named $200,000. It sounds great, it's motivating, but you know, we have a limited economy, and so at some point, if all those people take advantage of this new outcome and they're perfect angels and the world works in a perfect way, at $200,000 has got to slide to zero at some point. So 
maybe talk about the limits of those kinds of predictive uh, tools because they seem they get used a lot in the public, and they strike me as uh, disingenuous to some degree. The second related um, is another. Uh, so you also suggest that the um, barriers seem small um, based on this trial, which, again, from my vantage point as a historian, I mean, if I know anything, I know the persistence from the past to our present of incredibly inventive ways to maintain uh, racial power and segregation. And so just to use a simple concept, you know, could we imagine there's a tipping point at which too many people take advantage of these vouchers and white flight sets in and these communities revert to some disadvantaged community because uh, Pat suggests that these barriers are not so small. Um, and so that, that's, that's my question. Thank you. Raj. So thanks so much. Those are both excellent questions. Um, so uh, let me address the first point on the $200,000 calculation. So So let me just first explain how we come up with that number and then address the issue you've raised on, on its generalizability and applicability. So what we're doing is basically looking at children who've made similar moves across neighborhoods and looked at their experiences in the past. So for example, you can look at the moving to opportunity experiment uh, that was conducted in the 1990s and look at the outcomes of kids who made similar moves. Or you can look at other children who made similar moves in a large scale data set where we track millions of families that move across areas. And we see when we track children forward 20, 30 years that the children who move to the types of neighborhoods that I was describing as high opportunity have substantially better outcomes on a number of dimensions, higher college attendance rates, lower teenage birth rates, lower incarceration rates, and to, you know, one quantifiable thing, higher earnings, which you can aggregate over a lifetime and get an estimate like the $200,000 number. So that is what, what in economics we would call a partial equilibrium estimate where we're not dealing with the fact that the overall rate of wages in the economy might change. We're saying if one person moves, that is the gain that one person would get. Now, you raise absolutely valid point that if this happened on scale, maybe you know the return from making that move would be smaller, in particular if you had a view of the world that there's kind of a fixed set of jobs and it's sort of like musical chairs, like you now get into Harvard and you get the higher paying job and somebody else doesn't as a result, maybe on net you haven't actually you know, increased total welfare on an overall scale. So we can't directly address that in the type of study that I was describing here, but I would argue based on other evidence over the years by, by other scholars that a lot of these neighborhood effects are the development of human capital as opposed to kind of a zero-sum game where one person is doing better than another. So to give you one example of that, if you look at reforms that increase schooling for a large group of people, so a compulsory uh, schooling reform where everyone essentially in a cohort gets an extra year of education because the minimum age to drop out of school is changed, you see that virtually everyone in that, you know, on average, everyone in that cohort has substantially higher earnings. It's not that, you know, if one person gets an education, they kind of get ahead of somebody else, and that's the way you get a gain. Even where if everyone gets higher levels of education, we're seeing higher levels of earnings for a large group of people, which is not a definitive answer to your question, but suggests that we shouldn't think of the world as a, there's a fixed pie and a zero sum. You can see this with, you know, say fewer people getting incarcerated. That's not a zero sum thing, right? Like if people have a better, you know, do better on that dimension, it's not going to crowd someone else out. So I don't know for sure whether that $200,000 is going to persist, but I don't think we're in a world where it's going to become zero. More briefly, on the, on the second point, on whether the barriers are truly small. So absolutely, these things have persisted across generations. I don't want to downplay the importance of the various factors that have led to tremendous racial segregation, in particular in, in America. So first, let me point out that Seattle, we have to recognize, is a unique context. And it's a very different place from Chicago and different place from a city like Atlanta and so forth. So one of the things we're doing is trying to assess the extent to which that lesson holds in other cities with greater racial diversity and perhaps a different set of challenges. The second point, though, is as you saw in the map that I put up, one of the things we were encouraged by is the set of places to which people moved were incredibly dispersed. So it wasn't that everyone was moving to the same high opportunity neighborhood, which is precisely what I think would trigger the type of white flight or response that, that you'd be worried about. When you have 
a couple extra families dispersed across many additional neighborhoods, my intuition is that you're less likely to get that response. But you know, we will see. Both both good points. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a great question, and it's actually. It's the Ferguson question. Ferguson, as I, as I mentioned, was low uh, poverty and, all, and mostly white. And then they built apartments and some affordable housing, and there was a migration of African Americans there. And it's, there were 500 other suburbs in the St. Louis metropolitan area that were building McMansions and other sort of places where, they, where the white residents could move to because they didn't want to be near that. And so if you're one of those other white suburbs and you're looking at what happened to Ferguson, you would say, yeah, if we'll be driven to, to that if we allow anybody in. And the, that's because the, the rules of the game now allow these suburbs to do these restrictions. Exclusionary zoning is the law of the land. And uh, if every community, if every suburban jurisdiction within St. Louis was required to build some affordable housing in some pro relatively right, report, uh, right proportion, to the, to the income distribution of the metropolitan area, then there wouldn't be any one place that would be overwhelmed by people moving out. So, the, you know, the, the, the poverty rate is not 90%, it's, you know, 15%. So we don't need to overwhelm any one place if we open up all the communities to people being able to move there. So that's the answer. It's we have to have a change in the rules of the game that govern metropolitan development, and then no one place will bear the burden of, of solving these problems. And if those rules don't change, um, which I don't think they will, given the nature of uh, political reality in the United States. I mean, I think, Khalil, what your question um, motivates for me is that there needs to be a, a simultaneous research agenda on neighborhood change. Because there is a, you're talking about the equilibrium at the macro level in, in the economy and jobs, which I can agree with. but. Neighborhoods are not static entities, number one. The causal estimates, I mean, you know all this, um, are built from a prior period. Your, the assumption then is that the, the causal effect of growing up in that type of environment is equivalent today. We don't know whether that's true. Secondly, in terms of the movement, it, it assumes um, a stability of the neighborhood environment in which people move into. And we know from threshold effects and equilibrium models and so forth that that may not necessarily be true. And so what we're left with here is it, kind of a hypothesis, I think, is what you're saying, Paul, mm -hmm. is that if we changed all that um, in terms of the rules, then it would be even distribution. Although I'm not even sure that's true given the nature of social uh, mobility. That is to say, residential <laughs> mobility is, is a social network. It's not random. People tend to move in, in pathways based on friendships and social networks, which means then that there's clustering. There tends to be some level of concentration. So I think it's an open question. I think it's a great question. Um, we don't know the answer to. Patrick, would you like to speak to this before we move on? Okay. So we have about five minutes left and three people going up. First, we'll start with you. Um, first, let me just say I love the photos of Bill. Um, I have never seen them before. We can't hear you. I, I love the photos of Bill, and I haven't seen them before, so thank you for that, Rob. Um, my question is for the entire panel, and I had one observation, which is that much of the research in this area has focused on either urban neighborhoods or suburban communities and major metropolitan areas where we see as porn show clearly a, an increase in concentrated poverty. And I kept thinking, what is missing from the picture? And it is the rural communities from which the election of 2016 really happened. And I wondered whether or not we could apply the concept of concentration effects or neighborhood effects to those rural areas where the opioid epidemic is widespread? And if so, how do we think about space? And coming back to Pat Sharkey, and spatial inequality at that scale and in those very regions where I think we have neglected in studying for at least 40 years or so. Start very quickly. Um, thanks, Ben. Uh, so I, I think you're exactly right, and I think we have to consider different types of communities as part of a, a system. Uh, when, when we think about a system of space that is divided intentionally 
through not just land use regulations, but the incorporation of new governments, uh, um, the establishment of you know where systems of interstate highways have, have been located, where different types of housing is built, then it, it becomes a little bit easier to think about uh, places that are with very low density, whether rural or not, uh, as directly related to places with high density, high poverty. Uh, and, and the reason that we have places, uh, exurban uh, areas uh, that are, are long distances from central cities, where residents are, are isolated from the economic opportunities that might be more prevalent in central cities, uh, where people are dealing with long commutes, uh, where sprawl is happening. The reason all of that is happening is because we have used, we have uh, moved toward a system where we have a spatial project, avoiding all the, the challenges that started to emerge in the 60s and 70s uh, uh, and, and deciding not to invest to try to solve them, but to allow people to instead separate themselves, to think of these as uniquely spatial problems, has led to a system where we have areas that are uh, very isolated, but directly connected in that sense, in a relational sense, uh, with, with areas that are very dense that may be struggling with entirely different problems. So I think you're exactly right, but I think there are two pieces of the exact same problem. Um, just a quick comment. Um, I don't know if he cited truly disadvantaged um, in the hillbilly elegy. Yeah, they, he did. Okay. So, yeah, if, if, for those of you who haven't read it, I mean, that's an example, I think, Van, of what you're saying in terms of... Um, it's, it's sort of a, it's a bit of the truly disadvantaged in Appalachia. Okay, so we have about two minutes left. Um, I want to get both questions, and I would like for us to just allow the panel um, panelists to respond to them before we wrap up. Good idea. That's what I was going to suggest, too. I'm Catherine Newman. I used to work here. I now work over at UMass Boston. And I'm struck by a point that Raj made in his work that living in a neighborhood in which there's a high level of employment makes a very big difference for, for outcomes. So we are uh, now at a period of 50-year low in unemployment. And although for very poor neighborhoods that may mean nothing better than a transformation from poverty driven by unemployment to low wage work, that in my judgment is, is an improvement. It, it is an important improvement. So I'm curious, both for you, Raj, and for you, Rob, given your work, your early work that you cited about the relationship between violence and unemployment, mm -hmm. what do you think we have to look forward to if this persists? Um, I just filed a book proposal on this subject, so I'm very interested. And I don't think that we have very much literature, as far as I can tell, on the consequences of persistent tight labor markets probably because they don't always persist for so long. But they have been now, and there have been earlier periods in which that's been the case. So rather than moving people around, do we have anything to look forward to if we start to see much more persistent structural levels of employment in poor neighborhoods? Um, following that, I'm also a student of Dr. Wilson's who taught me to follow the evidence. If I have to get rid of that theory, get rid of it, if the evidence tells me to. Um, what I'm curious about is gentrification, because I live in D.C. where it's being highly gentrified. My daughter lives in Philadelphia, the same thing, the disappearance of, of manufacturing, but now a movement back into these inner cities that through the concentric circle ideas, you know, as the uh, immigrants improve, they would move out and things would get worse for those people there. But now we see the influence of people coming back into the urban areas. And I'm just curious about patterns you're seeing relative to this. Uh, with respect to gentrification, uh, I think there's uh, a couple of points. Uh, one is that a lot of places could use some gentrification. I'm, I'm in Camden, New Jersey, and... Uh, Right now, uh, th th that city would, would benefit from anything, any kind of activity that would produce uh, housing. Even if it was built solely for higher income people, there would still be benefits. And there wouldn't be displacement because there's so much empty space and vacant units. So that can happen. Uh, and some of the research that I've seen recently uh, you know, does suggest that in most places, 
uh, there's not actually a lot of displacement caused by gentrification, uh, and, and it actually benefits some of the longtime homeowners in the community when their property values go up. Yes, their taxes go up, but not by as much as, not by the same as the as the property value. So uh, they could be better off. Now there are some tight markets. Yes, where where, where gentrification, Washington D.C. is probably a good example, uh, where it really does cause some displacement. And they're really the same. The problem is the same as as what I observed in the suburbs, which is that our, the laws do not say you have to. We don't have a set of laws and, and policies in place that says we need to protect the existing affordable housing, some proportion of that, so that as a neighborhood improves. Uh, you know, there'll be some uh, place for the existing residents to, to, to live. Uh, instead, what we, you know, we have is the ability, you could literally, you know, in gentrification, uh, convert all the units, 100% of the units. So the, the, the laws and the zoning and the, and, and the, and the practices and the financing uh, allows you to do that in the suburbs and make them all one type of housing, monoculture of, of wealthy people. And that's in the suburbs, and it also uh, works uh, the same way in some of our inner cities. So there has to be a, a conscious attention to maintaining the affordable housing stock. They've tried to do that in Boston, as I understand, uh, and, and also in Newark. And so it's, it can be done, but it requires, uh, it requires the attention of the policymakers to think about that all the people who live there are not just the wealthy people who might want to move into a new neighborhood. Rob? Yeah, just real briefly, um, great questions. Catherine, and for me, uh, I think about the concept of stability um, or work instability, particularly in this kind of economy, I think is one way you could take your question, the contingency of work. And, um, I, you know, I've done earlier research suggesting that actually that kind of uh, a movement, even more so than unemployment, can have deleterious effects. So as we shift into this new world, I think we need more um, research on that kind of employment and going in and out and, and job instability. But also the concept of, of stability uh, works also at the residential level and the long stream of research on the effects of residential mobility on the social organization of neighborhoods. And we also know that there tends to be more churning and movement in poor neighborhoods, which is an important point because the right counterfactual isn't that if a neighborhood is gentrifying that poor people move out because actually it turns out that they're already likely uh, to move, and Pat uh, talks about this in his book, right? So in other words, actually, uh, the research is um, not clear at all that gentrification is a force of displacement of the poor in specific neighborhoods, but as a general phenomenon around the country uh, for that reason. There's a lot of uh, great research on that going on now, a recent paper by Jackie Huang, um, who addresses that very specific question. So a lot of what we think we know about gentrification um, seems to be wrong. Yeah. Raj. So uh, just to add a bit to what uh, Rob and Paul just shared. So I think those are both excellent questions that are tightly connected to each other. So in our ongoing works on the first point, uh, Kathy raised about the, the tight correlation and the cross section between employment rates and outcomes, you would think based on that, that in an era of tighter labor markets, especially if you have that in the lower poverty neighborhoods, you would see better outcomes going forward. And so that would, I guess, be a natural prediction. But that links to the second question of whether, you know, when you have changes in places, be it through gentrification or explicit place-based policies that try to raise levels of employment in certain areas, will you see commensurate changes in outcomes? And so we are trying to study that systematically. As many of you will know, that the big challenge in that space has been that we haven't had longitudinal data that allow us over long periods of time to investigate such changes. So we, uh, actually in collaboration with Kathy Eden and Larry Katz and a number of others here, are starting a set of projects using modern longitudinal data over 30, 40 years where we're hoping to be able to study this. And early indications are, don't have anything conclusive yet, but there doesn't seem to be a tight, necessarily a tight one-to-one -one link between changes in employment rates or gentrification and outcomes for the prior residents of a given area, whether or not they're, they're displaced. So the relationship dynamically seems much more complicated than what you might expect just based on the, on the cross-sectional correlation, consistent with what uh, Rob was just saying. So I think there's more to be learned there. But to me, you know, coming back to the theme of the session and, and this event, it sort of underscores, I think, the legacy of uh, Bill Wilson's work in the sense that it animates, I think, a research agenda that's going to occupy us and many others for decades to come. 
while also at the same time, I would emphasize, you know, the moving to opportunity approach, clearly not a scalable solution in and of itself. But on the ground, you know, we spend about $45 billion a year on affordable housing in the U.S. And I think in light of your work, there are families now living in neighborhoods where we are going to see significantly better outcomes for kids. So both, I think, the short-term practical impact and the longer-term uh, impact on, on research. Thanks very much. Patrick, would you like the last word? You don't have to take it. Sure. No, okay. I'm, I'm honored to have the last word. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, a few things popped in my head. But uh, let, me, let me just instead give a quick finding from work that I'm doing with uh, Gerard Torres Espinosa, who's in the back of the room. And it pertains to this, this issue of neighborhood change and gentrification. So we've been uh, carrying out this research agenda on the decline of violence. And I think this is one transformation that we haven't talked much that has really changed since uh, Bill wrote the truly disadvantaged. Uh, concentrated poverty has continued to rise, to rise, but violence has fallen dramatically and has fallen just about everywhere across the, the country. Uh, and this is a profound change. So when you look at the consequences of this, one concern in a lot of places is that as violence falls, uh, gentrification will emerge and people will be forced out. What we've found is that for the nation as a whole, there's not much evidence of that. In low vacancy cities, in hot markets, in places where there aren't many units to fill, there is evidence for it, okay? So as violence starts to fall, higher income, more white people, better educated people start to move in, the stuff that you would predict. And there is some evidence of that poor people are, rents rise and poor people start to be to move out or to be pushed out. So it's kind of this balance. You have, a, you have to tell a very complex story that in Camden, New Jersey, I think Paul's exactly right, that you want gentrification, you want people moving in, but it's hard to tell people in New York and San Francisco and Boston that gentrification's not a bad thing, it's not pushing people out, it's happening. So thank you, um, panelists, for an, a, a set of stimulating talks. And for the audience for lots of great questions. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. That means that everyone can take a seat because we're going to begin the session. Please have a seat and join us. My name is Jason Beckfield. I'm the chair of the Department of Sociology for 291 more days. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to be with you today. It truly is an honor to have uh, any kind of involvement in this wonderful symposium that I think is a really fitting tribute to uh, the, the intellectual giant and the generous uh, human uh, who, who Bill Wilson is. Um, so I want to say a few things to Bill um, as a way of starting out, um, because I can't resist the opportunity um, with this public setting to say a few things that are important to me and I think that are important to, to very many of us. Um, but before, uh, and then of course I'll introduce the speakers, but before I do any of that, um, I just want to give everyone, all of us, the chance to thank the organizers of this event, the people who are doing the excellent labor of putting all this together, um, Abby Wolf, the director of the Hutchins Center, as well as her many colleagues at the Hutchins Center. <laughs> Thank you all very, very, very much. Sorry? <laughs> That's right, as, as Abby downed some uh, well-deserved uh, uh, headache medication. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so Bill, I want to say three things, um, uh, and uh, I can't begin to, um, to summarize or, or really even take a tiny bit of um, the impact that, uh, that Bill has had on, uh, on me and on so many of us and on the entire field of sociology and on the world of social policy and you know, on, um, on uh, the, the world of US government even. Um, but, but I want to mention three things. And I think this is maybe the point in the program where some things start to echo Maybe more ambitiously, some things start to rhyme. The piece of it I want to echo is something very powerful and insightful, I think, that Cornell West said last night, which is that um, uh, William Julius Wilson remarkably embodies, at the same time, a rare genius, but also a rare generosity. And it's this combination that I think is just so special about Bill and that I think so many people have appreciated in their own ways. And so I just wanted to add my, uh, my appreciation of that. Um, the moment that that became clear to me um, was a moment in 2006 uh, when I arrived at Harvard as a, as a visiting assistant professor. And I was in uh, Rob Sampson's um, office. Rob was the chair at the time. And um, Rob was um, patiently trying to explain something to me in, in his wonderful way. Uh, and it just wasn't clicking. Uh, I have a tendency to be a little dull, a little confused. So you know, uh, Rob finally just lost patience completely. And he said, well, you just need to go talk to Bill. You know, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Just go talk to Bill. <laughs> and I had just arrived. <laughs> And you know, I'm running through the department's website in my mind, and I'm like, okay, you know, we have, we have no, we have a couple Marys, you know, we have a Frank, we have a Michelle, I'm, uh, we have a William Julius Wilson, but I, I don't think we have a Bill, you know. So I, I said to Rob, I'm like, Rob, like, you know, I'm sorry, like, I know I'm really wearing you out now, but like, what, you know, who's who's this Bill you're talking about? <laughs> and he, uh, you know, looks at me and says, well, you, know, you big doofus, I'm talking about Bill Wilson. Um, and, uh, and, and my jaw dropped and I said, well, you can't possibly be talking about William Julius Wilson. <laughs> no way. Uh, and he says, yes, that, that is the same person I'm talking about. Uh, now please leave my office. Uh, <laughs> so I um, had uh, 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 the first of many delightful um, conversations with, uh, with Bill um, soon after that, um, who, who has always been uh, very gracious to me and welcoming of me um, at this place um, and, a, and a stimulating interlocutor for, for you know, these many years. So I really can't thank you enough uh, for that, Bill. Um, that's, the, that's the first thing I want to say, genius and generosity. Um, the second thing I want to say is, is actually uh, an answer to um, the question that, uh, that Raj Chetty reported his, uh, his colleagues having about his uh, faculty affiliation with the Department of Sociology, 
which we very do, you know, very much do consider a promotion um, for sure. And and uh, and 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 if Raj's colleagues are confused, um, I would uh, I would submit that the answer to those questions is very simple, and that uh, answer is that William Julius Wilson is a sociologist. Um, <laughs> and I think it's a wonderful illustration of the the honor that he has brought um, to the field, um, and the and the really immeasurable impact um, he's had uh, on our field. Um, so that's the that's the second thing, um, and the you know third thing is you know a little a little more personal and um, you know it relates to um, my my role as as department chair. Um, uh, you know, as those of you who've been a chair know, you know, most of it is kind of a grind. But there are a couple of things that are fun, and one thing that's fun is when your colleagues have complete consensus about something, and only then. And only on that very rare occasion can you take the privilege of speaking on behalf of the department. And so I want to say something on behalf of the department because it is a point of unanimity, deep unanimity across the entire faculty, all of the staff, all of the graduate students, and all of the undergraduate students who are also inspired by you. Um, and that is, Bill, we love you. <laughs> All right, um, now on to our distinguished panelists um, uh, who are also intellectual heroes of mine. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm not gonna read you know, their entire bios, you can read that. I'm just gonna hit a couple things um, that, that mean uh, uh, something to me. Um, so first, um, we have Sheldon Danziger, who's the president of the Russell Sage Foundation. Um, many of us have been inspired by his work um, that's appeared in you know, innumerable books and articles over the years, um, especially America Unequal, and um, changing poverty, changing policies, um, uh, really fine work. And, um, and, and I, I want to take this moment to thank um, Sheldon for his work with the foundation as they write for the improvement of social and living conditions in the US. Um, many people in this room have benefited from the Sage Foundation. And I think, uh, why don't we just acknowledge his leadership um, in this setting. Um, second, um, Kathy Eden, um, who um, I badly miss as a colleague. Uh, I had the good fortune of, uh, of overlapping with Kathy for, for an entirely too brief uh, time here at Harvard. And um, many of us uh, know um, several of Kathy's works very well, um, particularly Making Ends Meet. Um, but there, there are two things that Kathy told me while, we had the, while I had the good fortune of, of being her colleague for a little while that, that stuck with me. Um, one was when I was trying to understand what HKS is. You know, we were like walking around and I just arrived here, right? Um, and I see, you know, Kathy, like, what's, what's the deal with this HKS place, right? And, uh, and, and Kathy said, well, it's really simple. Um, uh, HKS is one of the highest density places in the world of people trying to make the world a better place, um, which is how I've thought about it uh, ever since that conversation. Um, and, uh, and the other thing, one of the other things that Kathy told me um, uh, was that uh, you, you just need to, you know, do work that tells a story. You gotta tell a story. Um, and I'm, I'm nowhere nearly as good at storytelling as Kathy is, but um, I'm really happy that she's here and I'm willing to bet she's got some good stories for us <laughs> a little later on. Um, David Elwood um, is, um, is also here with us today. Um, and I wanna take a minute to, to celebrate um, David's distinguished uh, service to Harvard. Um, David was the dean of the Harvard Kennedy School, this um, place of very high density where people you wanna make the world a better place. Um, uh, from uh, 2004 through 2015, um, uh, and from 2016 through 2019, um, again, because he's you know, quite, a, quite a leader um, and quite a program builder, he was also the, uh, the chair of the uh, Malcolm Weiner Center, the director of the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy, um, uh, in addition to you know, his profoundly important work on social policy um, uh, in his own scholarship. Um, last, we have Larry Katz, um, 
Larry um, is very well known for lots of different reasons. Um, one is the, the brilliant book, um, The Race Between Education and Technology, um, which is uh, co-written with um, Claudia Golden, uh, really a brilliant work of economic history, um, beautifully rich and, and really inspiring. Um, I want to call out uh, Larry for a couple other things that are particularly admirable. One is that um, he served as the editor of the Quarterly Journal of Economics um, for quite some time, um, since uh, 1991. And so I think um, to the extent that economics has gotten more interesting over the last uh, 20 years or so, which I would argue it has, um, Larry deserves at least some of the credit for that. Um, he also has played a leading role uh, in the field in terms of um, sparking and institutionalizing what, uh, what he termed in a really interesting talk at the Kennedy School a few years ago, um, the credible inference revolution. Um, so we have quite an exciting panel here. You're not here to hear me. Please join us. Thank you. I think uh, I'm one of the oldest people to speak so far, and I think I've known Bill the longest. Uh, the first time, it's a little bit uh, like some of the others, I was um, um, a young assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin when Bill came and first talked about declining significance of race there. But then the paper that Rob cited as important, uh, the one that was Wilson and Neckerman, uh, I actually edited that volume. Mary Jo had a paper in that volume as well. It came out in Danziger Weinberg, 1984. So that's a little while ago. Um, we were asked to describe how the research of William Julius Wilson has influenced our own work. Um, and I would argue, and again, this is, I guess, repetition. Um, in a minute, I'll say something personal about my own. But I think um, uh, my generation of poverty researchers, my students' generation of poverty researchers, and the current generation of poverty researchers uh, continue to be influenced uh, by uh, Bill's work and his legacy. And as it was said this morning, it's uh, no sign uh, that that's um, going to change. Um, personally, um, uh, I looked back over my CV, and I'd say uh, one of the most important influence, uh, not only of my own research, but this comes up as well. My teaching and mentoring uh, owe a lot uh, to Bill Wilson. I spent 25 years at the University of Michigan the first two grants I got there was, were to set up, quote, the research and training program on poverty, the underclass, and public policy. Wonder where I got that <laughs> title from. So obviously, um, imitation is the ser serious form of, of flattery. Uh, the title was an ode to Bill's book, obviously. Um, but I have a personal story. The training program launched on the first Monday of April in 1989. Uh, there was a morning seminar. Uh, Bill came with a number of students, I think Jolene Kirshenman, Catherine Neckerman, and another one, another one or two. So we had a seminar, academic seminar in the morning. And then in the night, Bill was going to give a big lecture in, the room, in a big room like we had last night for people who have been Michigan Rackham Auditorium, I think it seats. 400. Why do I remember the day? Well, it turns out, you know, I probably got in touch with Bill in August and said, you know, how's the first Monday of April look like? But the first Monday of April 1989, for sports fans, Michigan was playing in the Final Four. <laughs> so luckily for us, it was on the West Coast, so the game didn't start till 9 or 9.30. And Bill, as everybody knows, is a basketball fan. And I introduced Bill, and Bill came up and he said, look, there's a game coming on. I'm going to go quick. Uh, so I, I very much, I knew after that, never have a lecture on the first Monday, even though at Michigan I could have done that because there haven't been that many good Monday nights in April. Um, but for the next 15 years, the Michigan Seminar on Poverty, the Underclass, and Public Policy uh, focused primarily on um, issues uh, that Bill raised. 
Um, the students, postdoctoral fellows, and faculty who participate include some of today's leading urban scholars. Some of the people who were involved are on the program today, including Michael Dawson, Mary Patillo, Sandra Smith, Al Young, many others, including well-known uh, scholars, Derek Hamilton, Rucker Johnson, and Prudence Carter. And so uh, that seminar was really, I'd say, the highlight of my teaching. Mary Corcoran and I uh, were, were fortunate uh, in those days. Uh, I guess I can say this. The Ford Foundation funded research and training. Um, and so we were very lucky uh, to be able to support um, uh, such young scholars who have gone on to do uh, terrific uh, research. Relatedly, in response to the truly disadvantaged, in 1998, the Social Science Research Council established the Committee for Research on the Urban Underclass. Um, it gathered uh, a number of scholars. I was fortunate to be on there. Sandy Jenks, who I know here yesterday, was one of the, the leaders. Uh, and the whole idea was to test Bill's hypothesis and to begin to fund research. Um, I remember, and I, I, I double-checked my fact, uh, Tom Segru got a pre-doctoral fellowship from the SSRC and his book and career speak for itself. Uh, Melvin Oliver and Jim Johnson established uh, the Center uh, for the Study of Urban Poverty at UCLA. So you can see there wouldn't have been a committee for research on the underclass without Bill. We funded young scholars, and they have continued uh, that legacy. Uh, it turned out that um, this is one of those things uh, about being generous to people, that payback comes. Um, Johnson, it, it, and I think it's about Bill's generosity, Johnson and Oliver set up this center. And so then they called me and said, would you come out and uh, give a talk? And you know, you're busy. But like Mary said, if somebody asks you and you care about it. So I went out uh, thinking I was doing you know, pure public good by helping them launch their center. And instead, they had this idea for what would become the multi-city study of urban inequality. And it really was Johnson and Oliver uh, who pushed that. And the funders said, well, there really ought to be some senior scholars involved. And so Ren Farley and I linked up. I don't know if Larry Bobo was here by then. Larry was at um, UCLA, and he had been uh, at, at Michigan, and he had done the Detroit area study. In any case, uh, uh, under Johnson and Oliver's leadership, we formed a large multidisciplinary, multiracial uh, leadership group uh, and um, uh, focused. All the issues were issues that Bill had raised. Race, space, worker attitudes, job search practices, employer preferences, hiring practices, residential preferences, segregation, racial stereotypes that Larry Bobo was doing early research, employer practices. Uh, the Russell Sage Foundation, little did I know I would be there, uh, be there now, but I, this is uh, a, a list, partial list of Russell Sage books that uh, uh, came out of McSuey and related work on neighborhoods, all of which is because of Bill's work. Um, Alice O'Connor, Chris Tilley, and Larry Bobo, uh, Urban Inequality, what Employers Want, Harry Holzer, Stories Employers Tell, Phil Moss and Chris Tilley, Prismatic Metropolis, Bobo, Oliver, Johnson, and Abel Valenzuela, Detroit Divided by me, Farley and Holzer, The Boston Renaissance by Barry Bluestone and Mary Stevenson, The Atlanta Paradox by David Soquist, and Won't You Be My Neighbor by Camille Zaprinsky Charles. As long as I'm pl plugging Russell Sage books, uh, Paul Jargowski's Poverty in Place. Um, um, Greg Duncan was part of an SSRC working group on communities, neighborhoods, family processes, and individual development. Again, Bill's influence, sociology, economics, political science, psychology, uh, two volumes. Um, uh, edited by Gene Brooks Gunn, Greg Duncan, and Larry Aber, uh, Neighborhood Poverty, Context and Consequences for Children and Policy, 
implications in studying neighborhoods. And as I looked at that, Rob Sampson has one of the chapters uh, in that book. Um, the other thing the SSRC committee started uh, was to fund uh, empirical research on neighborhoods. And I remember uh, the committee put some of the early money into geocoding, geocoding the panel study of income dynamics. And the early results were not promising, and I'd say economists were skeptical uh, about finding neighborhood effects. In retrospect, if you go back to the 1990s, Greg Duncan had 5,000 American families. Raj Chetty has 500 million American families. And so Raj is finding significant effects where Greg uh, found them. But the, the, the line is direct. Um, in fact, um, <clears throat> let me say something about when work disappears, another home run uh, of bills. Uh, I'll read one quote uh, from the book um, and, and point to its relevance today. Bill wrote, inner city black men grow bitter and resentful in the face of their employment prospects and often manifest or express these feelings in their harsh low-wage work settings. Their attitudes and actions combined with erratic work histories in high turnover jobs create the widely shared perception that they are undesirable workers. The perception in turn becomes the employer's basis for negative hiring decisions. Negative hiring decisions. Um, today, with the continued disappearance of stable, well-paid jobs for whites as well as blacks and Latinos, Employers seem to have negative attitudes across the board about such men. Uh, a recent Washington Post story about a firm uh, in rural white Wisconsin reported that they were bringing robots to the assembly line. Why? Uh, the description of rural workers could have been taken from uh, Bill's book. Quote, the line was intended for 12 workers, but two were no-shows. One had just been jailed for drug possession and violating probation. The story goes on to cite problems of these white rural workers with alcohol, despair, and depression, um, and the use of opioids and other drugs. Again, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. A recent article in a uh, new American Economic uh, Association uh, journal called Insights uh, by author Dorn and Hansen is titled, When Work Disappears, Manufacturing Decline and the, Falling, and the Failing Marriage Market Value of Young Men. This came out 